You're good there. And hey, just want to greet everybody watching my live stream. Thank you for joining us. We're in Mark chapter 4 right now. Um, I uh, really, you know, this week as I was before the Lord, I really kind of feel like God is wanting to keep me in the same vein that I was in last week. And, uh, you know, there's different times and seasons for different things. And, uh, you know, when, when God won't let me come off of that subject matter and uh, I just stay in that place, I know that he, can t- he wants to continue to talk about it. And I feel like it's something that is really faces um, us as Christians today, especially in the American church. And what I want to talk about is, is specifically is distraction. Um, I think that's one of the primary attacks of the enemy um, is to bring us in a state of distraction. And, you know, I talked about it a little bit last week, but how many know that just through the world that we live in today, we can constantly be distracted by a million different things? Just this, just this sucker right here, your phone, man. This thing right here can keep you busy with nothing. <laughs> 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, that technology in and of itself is evil. I think it's a good thing. It's a powerful thing. But it's a two-edged sword, just like television, just like radio, um, just like anything. But the enemy is always trying to get your attention and your focus off of the things that bring you life. And, um, and that's really one of his, his primary attacks. Because how I many know you can live in, in such a distracted state that you don't pay attention uh, to the things that are most valuable to you? You know, I mean, on social media, can, it can really, and I'm not just trying to hit social media this morning, I'm going to talk about distraction in general, but how I many know it can try to rob you of quality of life in your relationships? You know, there are, there are a lot of things that we need to, you know, that we have to multitask because we're in a busy world, and uh, we got to do a lot of different things at once, but how I many know the people in your life are not people that should be multitasks? You follow me? And, and there has to be this place where we can, you know, take the phone and sit it down and, you know, take, you know, television and turn it off and, and the internet and sit it over here and really focus on the things that matter. Because, you know, at the end of your life, you're not going to regret um, having spent, you know, you're not going to think, man, I wish I'd spent more time staring at my phone. <laughs> You know, I wish I'd have spent more time, you know, surfing the internet or, you know, watching cat videos or, or whatever, you know. Uh, and listen, please understand, I'm not up here legalistically trying to attack the, the cell phones or, so, or, or social media. I mean, all that all these things are given to us to enjoy, but I think that we have to be aware of the fact that if you live in a constantly distracted state, how I many know you're not going to be very effective? You know, and, and in our relationships, you know, there's a time, I remember about, I think a year ago, Stacy and I, we, um, we went to the place where we had our honeymoon when we first got married. And we went, it was a place in Tennessee called Pine Mountain, and it's like a little log cabin type place. And we went there, and before we went there, we just said, you know what, we're going to make a decision, we're not going to bring any social media with us, no cell phones, none of that. And we just spent a few days just like, looking at each other, you know what I'm saying? Like, like we, even, we even turned the couch around away from the television that was in the cabin, and we, fo- we focused it on the window, right? And it had like a fireplace. And like that first day, we were like, we were kind of like um, detoxing, you know? Like, I want to look at my phone, you know? I was like, I want to look at Facebook. I want to look at social media, you know, because you're so tuned to do that. And, uh, and then it's like that first 24 hours, we kind of like detoxed and then we kind of like came down and it's like, oh, wow, there you are. And then like we just talked and, and spent quality time with each other, like focused time. And man, it just had such a powerful impact um, on, on us as human beings and in our relationship. And we spent a couple of days with none of those distractions. And when we walked away from that cabin, it's like our, our relationship had really been like deepened and the quality of it had, was much better. Amen? And so, um, distraction is something, I think, that it really attacks um, everybody, but specifically in the New Testament, ch- in, in, in the, the church here in America, um, distraction is everywhere. And, and how many know you can get distracted away from God? Not just distracted away from our, our, our relationships in our life, but we can be distracted away from God. And one of the examples that I brought out last week is, you know, one of the ways that they tame a lion, if you see a lion tamer, they, they hold a chair 
in their hands and they got the, they've got this whip over here on the other side. But how I many know that chair doesn't have the power to stop the lion from attacking? But they constantly move the chair, which keeps the lion in a distracted state. As long as it stays in a distracted state, it's ineffective at making an attack. They did, the snake charmers do the same thing. You ever see those guys with the cobras and the cobras are moving back and forth? If you, if you watch what they're doing, they've got the cobra focused on something and they're keeping it moving all the time to where it never even realizes that it's being charmed and it's ineffective in attacking. And so one of the things the enemy tries to do is for, to us is to keep us in a constant distracted state where I'm so distracted all the time I can't focus on anything and uh, we end up not being really effective um, in our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. And how I many know it's something that we got to guard against as people? You know, this never happens to me, but you ever get, <laughs> let me say this, you ever get kids together to play, and then, and then they've been around food all day, but then they come home and they're so hungry because they never ate, right? I don't have a problem with that. I'm going to eat, amen? But... Like, Ethan can go to a birthday party, and he'll, he'll, you know, they have all these activities, and they're so distracted that they are, you know, just having fun, that they don't actually eat, okay? I mean, you know, if you and I were so distracted in our lives that we never fed on the things that brought us life, that it would bring us into a very weakened state. And I, and I feel like it's something that we have to guard against, it's something we have to be aware of, because focus is a dying art. The ability to focus on one person. The ability to focus on one thing. The ability to um, focus on God and receive from Him. Because we live in a society that has so many things going on all at once that's coming at us. I mean, you know, everything is clamoring for your attention. I mean, even when you're scrolling through Facebook or social media, how I many you know there's 20 things trying to sell you something? There's always pop-ups. There's always just everything just trying to draw our attention away. And, and we took a look at this passage of Scripture in Mark, and, and it, it literally gave a word that would try to come in, and, and it would reveal to us what this distraction is all about. And, and listen, as I'm saying this, please don't think that I'm trying to take a shot against multitasking. I mean, oh, there is a degree of multitasking that we all have to do. And I'm not saying that it's bad in and of itself, I'm not saying these things are bad, but I am saying that when we focus on the things that give us life and we focus on our relationships, I mean, you know, that focus is going to bring healthy results. Amen. So, uh, Mark chapter 4, and, and let's take a look here at verse 13, and this is talking about the kingdom of God. And this is kind of where I started last week, where, you know, the kingdom of God is a seed and it's sown into our lives. And how many know God has called us to bring forth fruit? That is a part of our Christianity is to be fruitful. Um, it was the initial command in the garden to Adam and Eve, you know, go forth and be fruitful. This is something that God has for our lives. And, uh, but I, I want to take a look at this concept of distraction as we get towards the end of this verse, and we'll break it down in the Greek. But Mark chapter 4 and in verse 13, it says, And he said to him, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown when they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, so endure only for a time, and afterwards tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So these are some examples of why the kingdom's not bringing forth in somebody's life, but that's not what we want to focus on uh, this Sunday. Now, this is what I want to focus on. It says, now these are the ones sown among thorns. They're the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things entering in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Okay? Now, the point here, becomes unfruitful, means the kingdom was in somebody's life and it was bringing forth fruit. What's some of the fruit of the kingdom? How many know love, peace, joy, kindness, goodness, gentleness, blessing? Uh, whether that be the health of your body or financially or protection or whatever, all of these things that are, are in Jesus that are a result of the kingdom of God. But it says here that these three things come in and choke it and it becomes unfruitful. So there was a time when it was fruitful and then it stops being fruitful because of these three things that happen. Now I shared last week that um, you know, I've not been blessed with a green thumb. Praise God, I've never grown anything in my life. Hallelujah. And uh, I, several years ago, I, had, I tried to grow some tomato plants, but I was working a, a full-time job, and I was in full-time ministry, and I was taking Greek classes 
uh, through the week, and I was so busy that I didn't have time to tend my little tomato plants. And as a result of that, I had five tomato plants, and they produced enough tomatoes to make one small bowl of salsa. Amen. Now, nothing wrong with the seed, nothing wrong with the ground. The challenge was so many weeds came in that it choked out the fruitfulness that was in the tomato plants, and they could not bring forth. So for our, and what I want to focus, and we looked at the deceitfulness of riches last week, we looked at the desire for other things last week, but what I really want to focus on, what I feel like God was highlighting, is the cares of this world. The cares of this world. Now, uh, point blank, when you hear that, you can think a lot of different things, but if we actually take a look at this Greek word, it's the word miramna, it means care, worry, and anxiety. I mean, on the world we live in, there's a lot of stuff trying to bring worry. There's a lot of stuff trying to bring anxiety. I feel like anxiety is almost an, an epidemic plague against the world. You know, I, I see kids dealing with fear and anxiety that I as a child didn't have. And I see, I mean, because it's everywhere. How many know the news is constantly blasting fear at you? The world is constantly blasting fear. And if you don't learn how to handle anxiety, if you don't learn how to handle fear, how I many it can absolutely overrun your life? And people try to handle it, um, and they try to handle it a lot of different ways that aren't really the powerful spiritual ways that Jesus has given to us. How I many know you don't have the ability to constantly control all your circumstances? See, the one way to try to handle fear and anxiety is to try to fix your circumstances and make your life perfect. How I many know that's a fallacy? You're not going to you're not going to be able to control your circumstances to the point that nobody ever disrupts your life. Like I, I, we were sharing on, uh, this morning, talking about uh, the people that drive slow in the fast lane. I just want to say, bless you in the name of the Lord. God bless you, people. <laughs> Y'all try to rob me of peace. <laughs> I'll be driving. Oh, they're driving five below in the fast lane, you know. And uh, how many you know there's a million things that are going to try to rob you of peace? Small things, big things, things everywhere, right? So trying to master your circumstances outside in is not going to allow you to conquer anxiety. How many know that we can try to medicate and, and be free from anxiety? And listen, I'm not being critical towards those who are on medication. Uh, my mother's on medication for anxiety, so I'm in no way, shape, form, or fashion being critical. It's, it, you know, the medical community has given us tools to help us, but there is a peace that passes understanding that's greater than what the medical community can give to you or what you can try to do through micromanaging the circumstances of your life to bring peace. And so that's one way people try to take care of anxiety through, through, through alcohol. They try to take care of anxiety through food, through, through sex, through sleep, through all these million different things to try to take care of worry and anxiety through entertainment. I mean, entertainment's a big thing. You're going through a lot of trouble in your life. You don't want to deal with it. Let's just watch 25 movies. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get our mind off of it, you know? And, and I'm not against watching movies or any of the things that I mentioned, but what I am saying is there is, a, there is a way for us to counter this attack against our hearts, uh, this attack of anxiety and fear, because if you can answer it with something more powerful than what this world can give, if you can answer it with a spiritual peace that's been given to you by Jesus. How many know Jesus has given you His peace? And I'm telling you right now, and the most powerful root of this peace that we've been given is this, because of the work of the cross, how I many know we now have peace with God? God is not mad at anybody in this place today. He loves you. Uh, you're forgiven. God is for you. You know, if you've not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the work of the cross was finished 2,000 years ago, and that forgiveness has been presented to you. All you've got to do is call upon the name of the Lord. It's already been set to humanity's account. Our part is to simply believe it and receive it. But peace begins in understanding this. God is for you. When the hurricane rages, God is for you. When the fire falls, God is for you. When tornadoes hit the ground, God is for you. I mean, you, know, you cannot judge God's opinion of you by the circumstances that you have in this life. The Bible says that nothing shall separate you from the love of God, neither sword nor peril nor all of these things. How do these things try to separate you? Because the question arises is, if, if God really loved me, then why is this happening in my life? I want you to understand, everything that happens on this planet is not God's will. When, when God, Jesus said, pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
See, God's will is done 24 hours a day, seven days a week in heaven. You know what? There's no sickness in heaven. There's no disease in heaven. There's no calamities in heaven. There's no dysfunction in heaven. Why? Because God's will is being perfectly done. But how many know down here on earth, people have something called free will? And the Bible says all creation is groaning and travailing. How many know when Adam fell, sin entered in, and this world did not become a perfect place? In fact, it stepped away from the garden. The curse came. And how many know there are things that we fight in this world that are a result of Adam's fall? So you have to understand something. Everything that happens on this planet, there are people stand up saying, well, God sent this hurricane. That is garbage. I just hate the fact that it's amazing to me how someone make a statement like that, and immediately that person gets national news. You know, but then you got someone carrying good news, and now we're not going to give that attention. We're going to say this flood is of biblical proportions, and this is the wrath of God and all that. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, sin was forever condemned in His body. And God's heart towards humanity is nothing but good. So everything that happens in this world is not God's will, but when things happen to you that are challenging, how many know it can cause you to try to question? And I want you to understand something right now. You don't have anybody in your life that's more for you than God is. And He will help you to ride out the storm. He will help you to overcome. He will stand with you in the midst of your trial and your torment. But the one thing you need to know is when you fail and you fall, you can count on God being for you. He's not a fair-weather friend. Can I get an amen? When you sin, when you make a mistake, God is still on your team. God is still on your side. Now, when you start to understand that, it begins to bring a peace into your life and your heart so that you can have peace in the midst of the storm. You can have peace in the midst of the battle. And so when anxiety and fear tries to come, we can simply say what Jesus said, I let not my heart be troubled, neither do I let it be afraid. If there is one thing that I teach in my house to my wife and to my son, probably more than anything else, it's maintain peace. Because when peace isn't there, that's when arguments happen. When peace isn't there, that's when strife takes place. See, when someone gets sloppy with their peace and they let something take their peace away, how many know that's when we start getting anxious, we get angry, we get fearful, and that's when things aren't happening? How many know you can speak not in a place of peace? You can speak in anxiousness, you can speak in anger. When you're doing that, you need, to, you need to recognize you've let that peace that God's given you slip, and you need to get back into peace, because we're not going to have our households dominated by anxiety. We're not going to have our households dominated by fear or anger. We're going to maintain peace. And how I many you know you don't have to generate this peace, it's been given to you by Jesus. God has given you His peace, we maintain it, and when, when it starts to slip... I say, out of my mouth, I agree with what God has said. I say, I let not my heart be troubled, neither do I let it be afraid. Let me get my peace back in place, and now we can continue to move forward. Now, I'm not opposed to, you know, all these other things that I mentioned. I'm not saying those things are bad or evil, but how many know you have something from heaven that's more powerful than what the world can give you to maintain peace and get rid of anxiety? And you have to learn how to do it. It's something that you learn how to do. Some of us, we've spent so much of our lives living in anxiety and fear that we don't even know how to live another way. And that's where the gospel comes in, because the gospel, when properly preached, is always going to deposit fear in your heart. Excuse me. Always going to deposit peace in your heart. How many of us called the gospel of peace? God wants to take His good news and let you know God loves you, you're forgiven, and God is for you. And if God be for you, there's nothing this world can throw against you that's greater than God's power. Can I get an Amen. And so it brings you into a state of peace. But what the enemy wants to do is distract you from the reality that God loves you, to distract you from the reality that God is for you, and to even distract you from feeding on God's love. How many know everybody in here, you need a regular dose of love? You need a a fresh I love you from heaven. You need to be reminded that God loves you. Why? Because there's so many things that would try to testify and convince you that God doesn't love you. How many know the enemy is the accuser of the brethren? He's always trying to convince you that God's mad at you, God's against you, and God's disappointed in you. And not only that, how many know our own behavior, our own mistakes can try to testify and make us believe that God's not for us? Listen, God's, God's faithfulness to you is not based on your faithfulness to Him. God's going to be faithful to you when you are not faithful to Him. God's going to be faithful to you when you're not faithful to yourself. Because God knows that His faithfulness is so powerful, He'll drive that unfaithfulness out of your life 
and you'll be faithful to him because of the strength of his faithfulness to you. And so I say all of this to say this, you need a regular I love you from heaven. That's what the gospel is, and we need to drink in that love and not get distracted away from it. Because if we get distracted away from the things that feed us, and we get caught up in anxiety and care, how I many know we can, you know, one of, the, one of the marks of insanity is the inability to concentrate. I mean, the enemy would really try to attack somebody's mind and leave them in a state of unable to focus or think on anything. And God wants to bring a, dis- a stability into our lives. And so this word, the cares of this life that try to choke out our fruitfulness, I want to take it, take it a step further and let's look at the root of this word. And, and in the Greek, it's the word marizo, and it means to divide. Dividing and fracturing a person's being into parts Divide through the idea of distraction. So this world is always trying to divide our attention and trying to choke the faithfulness of God's Word in our lives. And so let's turn to Matthew 14. And literally in the Greek it means to be drawn in different directions. So everybody here, we want to fight against this. And what do we want to focus on? We want to focus on God's love for us. And ultimately, you know what you want to focus on? Is Jesus. But what I want to talk about here in this time that we have together, I want to take a look at a practical way we can stay focused on Jesus. Because I think people make that statement on a regular, oh, just keep your eyes on Jesus. Oh, just stay focused on Jesus. And it sounds great and it can almost get cliche, but what does that mean Monday? (laughs) What does that mean like in my daily life? What does it look like me not being distracted and me being focused on Jesus so that I can be focused on the people that matter most in my life. What does that look like? So Matthew 14, and I want to take a look here, and, and just to, this is a beautiful example of the enemy, of someone being focused on Jesus and miraculous, powerful things happening, and then the enemy bringing in dis- distraction. And this is when Peter steps out of the boat to walk on the water. Matthew 14, verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, If it is you, command me to come to you in the water. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, how many know here we are, we have have a disciple focusing on the one who loves him, on the one who is his Savior. How many know when you're in the presence of Jesus, all of a sudden you can be confident? Because you know you got somebody who cares about you and loves you. You know, even like, for example, my son, if my son has a bad dream or, or whatever in the middle of the night, I mean, you know, all he's got to do is hop in mom and daddy's bed and he's good to go. Even though the book, you know, like, it's not like, it's not like the boogeyman is, you know, I mean, there is no boogeyman, but my, but my, <laughs> amen. It's not like, you know, he's not, you know, <laughs> all right, it's neological fear, but in the presence of his parents, there is no fear. Like, bam, in bed with mom and dad, and boogeyman's gone, I can sleep great, and I'm going to take my foot and lodge it in my dad's neck, and then I'm, <laughs> I'm going to karate chop my mom all night, and I'm going to be the only one that sleeps good. Amen. Praise God. No, I'm just kidding. But in our pre- when we're around, he's confident, right? Because he knows we're you know, the, his protectors or whatever. But how many know that, that when you understand that God is for you, that there's a confidence that arises out of you. And if you understand the new covenant, how many know God is not just in heaven any longer? How many know now you are the temple of the living God? When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God comes to dwell inside of you. So a lot of times we can look at, at, the, at the gospel and say, man, I just wish I could have walked with Jesus and saw Jesus and spent time with Jesus. Folks, Jesus is living inside of you. So tomorrow morning when you go to work and when you're driving to work, God is li- Jesus is living inside of you by, by His Spirit. But how I many know sometimes we can forget that? And we can get unfocused on that, and that's when the fear and anxiety can come. And so we see here Peter looking at his Savior, being confident, saying, look, he's walking on the water. If he asks me to come, I can walk on the water too because I know that, that he's powerful and he loves me, he's with me, and he's for me. But... We see him step out of the water, but then you know what we see? We, de- we see distraction. Listen to me. The devil is trying to distract you away from what gives you life. Yeah. Right. Period. 
He does not want you feeding on Jesus Christ. He does not want you feeding on the bread of life. And so, sometimes we have challenges that come into our life, and the purpose of these challenges, the enemy's not just trying to bring these challenges to overcome you through the challenge. He just wants to distract you away from Jesus. He wants to distract you away from what gives you life. And because all the time the enemy's trying to develop a sense of idolatry in us. What is what is idolatry, Jeremiah? It's when I take something and I put it up on a pedestal and I say, this is more important than God. I mean, you know, anything can be an idol. Anything. And all of these things that we have in this world, how many of you know, I was talking about football earlier. Praise God. Love football. It's great. I'm, me and Jesus are going to watch some football together today. He's a Packers fan. I talked to him. Amen. <laughs> he likes the winning team. No, I'm just kidding. Forgive me. But how many you know sports can be enjoyed, and it's a good thing, but how many know there are people that worship Sports figures. Sports can become a form of idolatry. I mean, no, movies can become a form of idolatry. Um, entertainment can become a form of idolatry. Food can become a form of idolatry. A person can become... Anytime I take something and I lift it up above God and say, you're more important than God, it's at that point that I've begun to emaciate myself because I'm trying to feed on something that can't really bring me life. Listen, no person can save you. Never put a human being in the position of your salvation because you will be sorely disappointed because that person is going to let you down and that person does not need that type of weight and responsibility in their life because can't nobody save you but Jesus. And when we, and so the enemy is always trying to distract us and bring us to a position of changing our priorities where something or someone is more important than God. Now listen to me. Please understand this. Serving God and receiving from God are two completely different things. The number one thing God wants you to do in your relationship with Him is receive from Him. Right. Most important thing. Receiving love. Amen? Receiving it. Then after that, we serve God. But number one is receiving. And so right here, we see Peter, okay? And he's doing amazing things with Jesus, but here comes the enemy with the distraction. Let's look at it. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous. He was afraid and began to sink. Now, what I want to show you is, listen to me, and we share this example a lot, but how many know it's just as easy to walk on water on a windy day as a not windy day? Amen? Walking on water is impossible, and it is a miracle. And so, how many know the wind did not have the ability to rob Peter of life? But how many know the wind did have the ability, listen to me, to distract him away from who was giving him life. And how many know you can have something come up in your family, in your finances, and it can try to dominate your thought processes? Listen to you, folks. Worry does not have the ability to change your future in a productive way. There is nothing good about worry. There's nothing powerful about worry. But how many know the enemy will try to shoot thoughts of failure and defeat into your head so much that you'll spend all your time meditating on evil, thinking about the problem, thinking about failure. And I want to tell you right now, that is not what your mind was designed for. God does not want you worrying. God wants you focused on Him receiving life, recognizing that God is for you. Can I get an amen? And so... When we get our eyes off of the Lord, how I many know immediately Peter began to sink? And he, and, he, and, and he beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Now immediately his attention came back to the Lord. Jesus reached out a hand, saved him. They walked back to the boat. But what I want to show you is he was distracted away from the Son of God. This is something that we need to, to guard against. Now, um, let's turn to John 1. And as you go, now, now I want to just take these last few moments we have and I want to talk about the practical aspect of, of fighting against distraction and staying focused on Jesus. We want to look at this from a practical sense. How do I do this next week, right? Isaiah 26 and verse 3, I'll read this to you as you turn to John, but it says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. There is this place of keeping our minds stayed on the Lord that will keep us in a state of peace. Because here's the thing, nothing that any of you have faced or ever will face will be stronger than God. Nothing. There is nothing that will ever come into your life that is stronger than God. 
And when I, when I am focused on God, and I recognize that He's for me, how many know that when the challenges come, when the trouble comes, I can have peace in the midst of the challenges because I trust the One who loved me and died for me. Amen. You know, when we see the disciples, you know, when they walked with Jesus, how many know they, they were confident when Jesus was with them? Because they knew the Son of God was with them. They were confident in the midst of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Roman soldiers. But as soon as Jesus was smote in the Garden of Gethsemane, as soon as the Roman soldiers came and got Him, how many know 11 out of the 12 immediately lost confidence? And the one who appeared to be the bravest of them all denied the Lord three times with cursing. What happened? Because the presence of the one that they trusted was removed, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But I'm, and so they lost confidence. But I'm here to tell you right now, there is no power in the universe strong enough to smite your current shepherd. Your shepherd was smote and overcome, and now he lives forevermore. There is no power in, he in heaven or hell that can remove Christ out of you or can change God's favor towards you. God is for you, God loves you, and He's on your team, and He's on your side, and you need to know that when you're facing the challenges that arise against you. And if you can keep your mind stayed on who He is, then you can be confident and trust Him. The challenge is, a lot of people have this very demented version of who God is, and so they present this veiled, angry face of, you know, there are people saying that, you know, that God is the one, you know, sending earthquakes and, and tornadoes and hurricanes and all of these things. And, and, you know, if I thought that's who God was, then I wouldn't have confidence in His presence. If I believe that God was the one that sent evil, um, how many know if, if I'm around somebody that wants to hurt me, it's not going to make me more confident when I'm in their presence. And that's why it's so important that out of the book of James, it says, He is the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. He's the Father of lights in whom there's neither variableness nor shadow of turning. What does that mean? Every way you turn, God, He's good. All the way around. God does not bring evil. God does not do evil. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Did you ever see Jesus put sickness on anybody or hurt anybody or break anybody's leg when He walked this earth. You never did. Why? Because that's not God's will. Amen. And some people will say, well, what about the Old Testament? It seems like God changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Under the Old Testament, the, the identity of who God was was not revealed. They did not, under the Old Testament, the Jewish people did not even have the ability to say God's name. How I many know you cannot develop a relationship with somebody if you can't even say their name out loud? Because under the Old Testament, the Bible says it was a shadow of the truth. The law and the prophets did not have the ability nor the privilege to reveal the Father's heart. Only when the Son came could the Son reveal who the Father truly was. Just being honest with you, does that mean we throw away our Old Testament? No. But you've got to take the Old Testament and you've got to look at it through the lens of the cross and recognize the law and the prophets were not the revelation of the nature of God. Just being honest with you. God does not send bad things. God does not do evil things. God does not hurt people. He's a good God. Amen? And so, as I understand the nature of God, and I keep my mind stayed upon Him, how I many know oh, now my heart can begin to trust and my heart can begin to have confidence in the midst of the storm? Now, we learn, so, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Here's an aspect of who Jesus is in John 1 and verse 16. It says, Of His fullness we have all received... And grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. A part of keeping your eyes on Jesus and staying focused on Him is realizing that He is filled with grace and truth. What does that, what does that mean for you and me? Well, this is what it means. I mean, oh, grace is God's unmerited, undeserved favor. You know what that means? That means that when I come to Jesus... I don't have to qualify myself to receive His love. I don't have to qualify myself to receive His blessing. How I many know oh, we are to run boldly to the throne of grace to attain help in time of need? What You know what grace says? Grace says God's going to be good to you because He loves you. God's going to deliver you because He loves you. And so when we recognize that Jesus is the embodiment of grace and truth, 
we know that now when I keep my eyes on Jesus and when I see Jesus, I know he's my savior and he's going to save me because he loves me. You know what it does, man? It completely breaks off all of that bondage in your life to where you think you've got to somehow qualify for God's love and God's salvation. No, 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 no. He's filled with grace and truth. You know what that means? He saves you because he loves you. And let me break it out to you like this. Let's say that we have somebody that's drowning, and they're in a pool and they're drowning. I mean, you know, the, the job of the lifeguard is to save that person. The job of the lifeguard is not to swim down to the bottom where they're, they're flailing and dying and drowning and say, did you pay for your ticket today? <laughs> because you're only qualified to be rescued if you paid for your ticket. Or, how I many you know the job of the lifeguard is not to swim down to the bottom of the, of the pool and say, um, here's a book on how to swim. Read it and you can be saved. How I many you know the job of the lifeguard is to, to dive and plunge into that water fearlessly and boldly and save the person that's drowning because the lifeguard is called to save them. Listen, you have a Savior. And He's not going to charge you admission. He's, not go he's going to dive fearlessly and boldly into the ways and the challenges of your life. And He's going to rescue you because He loves you. And don't you believe any lie of any enemy or well-meaning religious person that says you somehow disqualified yourself from the salvation of Almighty God because you can't disqualify yourself from something that's free. It is for free that He saves you. Can I get an amen? He saves you because He loves you. And when we understand that Jesus is full of grace, we know that when we see Him and keep our eyes on Him, we are qualified to receive. Can I get an amen? There's nothing wrong with God, there's nothing wrong with His Word, and there's nothing wrong with you because the blood of the Lamb has cleansed you. So put your shoulders back, get bold, and receive everything that God has for you. Do not think that you have the ability to disqualify yourself from amazing grace. You don't have that ability, I'm sorry. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Yep, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. God's power and His grace is way more powerful than man's inability to do what's right. It's good news, isn't it? You know what it says? It says, God said, I'm going to be faithful to you when you fail. Amen. So a part of staying focused on Jesus is recognizing this is a God of grace. This is a throne of grace. I am qualified to receive. Because I mean, a lot of times the enemy will try to convince you, well, this is happening in your life because you did this and this and this. The reason you're dealing with these financial problems is because you did this and this. Do you know <laughs> that your mistakes don't disqualify you from God's salvation? God will rescue you when you made the mess. If He doesn't rescue you when you made the mess, then He's not a proper Savior. Let's think about the thief on the cross. Did he do anything right? No. There he is on the cross, dying for all his transgressions. Jesus didn't stop and ask him if he paid his tithes. Jesus didn't ask him about his temple attendance. Jesus didn't ask him about his education. He didn't demand an offering from him. You know what he did? He saved him. You know why? Because that's what God does. He saves people. Amen? And so, understanding this, you have a God who is a God of grace, and He loves you, and He's for you. And a part of staying focused on Him is understanding that He's filled with grace. Amen? Now, uh, let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. We've got a couple more places, and we'll, we'll close here this morning. Talking about staying focused on the Lord, talking about being set free from distractions. 1 John chapter 4, and in verse 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. Now, the, the next way that, that, that viewing, keeping our, keeping our focus on Jesus is going to help us is understanding this. How many know that now Jesus has become your righteousness? Jesus has become your identity in Him. I mean, no, you no longer have, a, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you no longer have an identity outside of Christ. I mean, no, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So now, I mean, no, there's neither male, nor female, nor Jew, nor Greek. None of these things. Now your identity is in Him. So, as you behold Jesus and you put your eyes on Jesus, how I many know you are now reminded of who you are? 
Now, please understand this. How many know that He is the head, but how many know we are the body? When you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, how many know you step into Christ? And you lay down that old nature. You lay down that person that you used to be. And now we become the body of Christ. Everybody say body of Christ. Amen. So now that you're a part of the body of Christ, when you're staying focused on Jesus, you're being reminded of who you are in Him. And what this does is, it empowers you to remove the lies of the enemy. Because how many of the enemy is going to try to challenge your standing with God? He's going to try to challenge even your goodness. How many know one of the greatest things the enemy wants to try to get over to you and me is to believe that you're not good? He wants to try to get you to believe that you are bad. The Bible says our faith becomes effective when we acknowledge every good thing which is in us in Christ Jesus. You're good because God made you good. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that you're good before you're saved. How many know before you're saved, how many of you need Jesus? The Bible says clearly that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But once you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it, you shall no longer identify with the fallen nature. No longer identify with the person you used to be. And so when you get your eyes on Jesus as He is, so are we in this world. The Bible says that we are changed into the same image from glory to glory as we behold in this mirror. What ends up happening is you get re-solidified in who you are so that the temptations and the accusations that come against you fall to the wayside. Let me give you an example. I used to be addicted to... uh, all kinds of things. But one of the things I was majorly addicted to was uh, smoking weed, smoking marijuana. And um, it was one of the most challenging addictions. You know, I got set free from the alcoholism, got set free from the pills and the cocaine and the crack and all that type of stuff. But the last drug stronghold in my life was smoking weed. And I, um, it was just really difficult for me to let go because I had developed a chemical dependency on this thing's ability to make me happy. It was the way I found happiness was, was, was getting high. And God, how I many know God does not want anything in your life to determine your happiness or your joy but Him? And so this thing had developed into an addiction into my life. And so slowly, God began to set me free because how many know if I'm in Christ, I have a new identity? How I many know I'm not a pothead? I'm not a drug addict. I'm not these things. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so God began to make that real to me that I had a new identity in Him. And I can remember at that time I was doing a lot of running. And I was running up this hill. Some of y'all have heard this story before. But I was running up this hill and I looked down onto the ground and I saw a, uh, what I would, (laughs) I saw a marijuana cigarette. (laughs) A joint. And uh, it was like half of a joint. And how many know the enemy wants me to go back to my old behavior. He wants me to take this bait. Now, you know the real reason he wants me to take it? Because he wants me to identify with being a drug addict. That's the real reason he wants me to take it. It's not even the issue of the actual act. He wants to mar uh, this this beauty of this new creation that I have in Christ. And so I I knelt down and I picked it up and I smelled it. And sure enough, it, it was what it was. And how many know at that point, I had a decision to make whether I was going to partake of this and go back to old behavior or whether I was going to see Jesus, focus on Him, and recognize I have a new identity in Him. And so I picked it up, I looked at it, I smelled it, I realized what it was, and I dropped it back on the ground. I took my foot and I ground it into the asphalt and I kept running and I said, I am not a drug addict. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so what I want to show you is I did not overcome that as a result of my willpower. I overcome that as a result of my identity in Christ. And so rather than me looking at my past and looking at my old behavior, I put my focus on Jesus and I said, in Christ, that's not who I am. How many of you can do that with anything? You can do that with anger. You can do that with lust. You can do that with fear. You can can look at Jesus and say, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. As He is so am I in this world, this is not who I am. I am what He says I am. Can I get an amen? 
He is my peace. He is my stability. He is my wisdom. And so there is this place of focusing in Jesus that will re-solidify your identity and remind you who you are. If you look at it in the book of James, it's called the law of liberty. So many times people walk, the reason people go back to old behavior is they walk away from the mirror, they see the reflection, they walk away from the mirror, they forget who they are. And when you forget who you are, you go back to old behavior. How many know when you sin and make a mistake, that's not who you are? Can I get an amen? It's not you. God didn't create you to be that way. God didn't create you to be an angry, fearful person. Amen. You get back, look in the mirror, see Jesus, get reminded who you are, and stay free from old behavior. Amen. And so, um, and then just two more places and we close. But the, the next area that I think it is a real, will really, in Psalm 1, talking about staying focused on Jesus. Number one, realizing that He is a God of grace. Number two, recognizing that your identity is in Him. And number three, and this is a powerful thing, this is something God's really revisited and brought back into my life. How many know that Jesus is the Word? And man, there's this place, you know what you, know what you can focus on when you're going through a trial? The Scripture. The promises of God, man. You get in there, and you, you, know, you, you find out what type of situation you're in, and you take a Scripture. How many know you can take your attention off of the battle and put it on the promise concerning the battle. That's what you do when, you, when, when we use that saying, I let not my heart be troubled, neither do I let it be afraid. What I'm doing is I'm taking my attention and I'm putting it on Jesus in the form of Scripture. And I'm going to put my attention on the promise rather than on the problem. That's why David said, come magnify the Lord with me. I mean, oh, we can take our time and attention and we can focus it on what God has said about the situation. It is, the most, it is one of the most powerful things in the world. Because every time you turn to Psalm 1, it says the same thing. Every time you turn to Romans 5.17, it says the same thing. It is a constant strength in your life. And how many know that's what Jesus used to defeat the devil? Jesus could have defeated the devil a lot of different ways. But He chose to do it the way that He wants us to do it. Jesus, as the Word of God, could have said anything because whatever comes out of Jesus' mouth is Scripture. <clears throat> He's the Word. Whatever He says, bam, it's Scripture. But what he did was, when he defeated the devil, he said this, it is written, it is written, it is written. Don't allow the pain of the past to rob the power of Scripture from your life. There is power in the Word of God. It is life, healing to your flesh, to your bones, to your spirit. And man, when you take some Scripture and you start rolling it around in your heart and in your mind, there's such a strength and a stability in it it will help refocus you back on God. And in Psalm 1, it's a powerful passage of Scripture, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the word of the Lord, and in his word he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Ladies and gentlemen, there's this place of taking Scripture and meditating in it, thinking about it, allowing it to just roll around in your heart. And I promise you, you'll draw strength and nutrients out of it as you sink the teeth of your mind into it. So powerful. You know, I just got back to the simple thing of just reading out Psalms. Psalm 103, Psalm 91, Psalm 89, Psalm 23. Just reading them out loud. As I do that, it's like, it's like, there's some, it's like all the power of the distractions and this, this, you know, all the stuff that I'm dealing with, it's like I get my attention and my focus just back on God. And it's like as I'm just reading it out loud and thinking about it, it brings all of the power of my focus back to where Jesus becomes bigger than everything else that's around me. And there's such life and strength in it. And I know that some of us have come out of backgrounds where um, those things were used in, a, in an incorrect manner and it was almost as if you know, the Bible itself was deified and all of that. And, and I understand that and some of you have never experienced that. But um, there is power in the Word of God. And we cannot lose this power that God has given to us. Because you can take your heart and your mind and you can, like the, the people that are going in, in Florida, if I was in Florida right now, you know, what I'd be, you know what I'd be looking at? Psalm 91. I'd be speaking it out. I'd be praying. I'd be saying it over my family with boldness. Because there's power in it. It's God's promise to us. Psalm 91 is a psalm of protection. Amen.
And this is something that's been given to us as a gift. This is one of the major ways that you bring your focus back in on God. Amen. Now, we're closing here. Philippians 4. And um, talking about maintaining our focus and keeping our eyes on Jesus. And we've, I've, I've shown probably three or four things on what we focus on. But how many know a part of focusing is not being distracted by other things? Like number one, I'm going to look and I'm not distracted. But number two, um, I'm going to make a decision not to allow distraction to dominate me. And there's a tremendous amount of wisdom in this passage of Scripture. We're going to close right here. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. That's the key right there. Thanksgiving. When you're praying to God, be in a... Now, we have those times when we're upset and we run our mouth, and that's okay. Can I get an amen? Yes. Have those times. You've got to be real with God. You, you know, if you're mad, be mad. He can handle it. If you're sad, be sad. He can handle it. If you're going to weep, weep with those that weep. You be yourself around God. Can I get an amen? But we want to come back to a place of thanksgiving at the end of the day. Because the spiritual barometer of your life is the thankfulness. And right now, if God never did another thing for any of us ever, as long as we live, we have enough to be thankful for for eternity. And when you come back to that place of thanksgiving, a heart of thankfulness is not going to be overcome with anxiousness. How many know we live in a world of entitlement where people are not thankful and they're fault-finding and critical and upset and mad? How many know those folks don't have peace? You know, if, if, if I'm in line and everybody wants to start complaining, I'm not joining. I'm not going to. I mean, you know, you can be in, and be in a line and everyone in there just wants to complain about what's going on. If you join in with that, you're going to lose your peace. Don't join in with that. Focus on what you have to be thankful for. Amen. Now, I'm not, as I'm saying this, please don't think I'm up here like I got this, this halo over my head and I always do that. I was just talking about getting upset, being behind people in the, in the, in the, slow lane, or the fast lane and the slow lane. Slow people in the fast lane. So please don't think, you know, I make mistakes all the time. But what I want to say is this, this place of, this place, how I many know you can be thankful? And out of that place of thanksgiving, it's going to guard your heart. Amen. It says, let your request be made known to God and the God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Is that attractive to y'all? That's very attractive to me. And then I love this. This is this last piece of wisdom in regards to distraction. Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, pure, lovely, of a good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, <clears throat> meditate on these things. Think about this stuff. And the things that you have learned and received and heard in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our template on what we want to spend our days thinking about. And, 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 and we have to be careful. Like I was talking about earlier, we have to be careful. We are flooded with bad news. And, and I, it never ceases to amaze me how unpopular good news is and how popular bad news is. But how I many know that we have a decision to make that if, if what we're dealing with is not true, not noble, not just, not pure, not lovely, not of a good report, with no virtue, I mean, <clears throat> we don't want to spend a whole lot of time allowing that to occupy the space of our minds. Not if we want peace. There is, peace is not automatic. I mean, it's a decision. If I'm going to focus on stuff that freaks me out, I will live freaked out. I just am. If I spend all of my days devouring news, I mean, I'm going to stay scared. <coughs> Even though the Prince of Peace is living on the inside of me. I mean, you know, there's an element of this where the ball's in, in our court where we choose what we focus on and what we don't. I mean, it really is. And I know it's difficult. I know it's a challenge. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm not one that spent a lot of time in the news in, my, in the younger years of my life, but I feel like the older I get, I'm more, I guess, concerned or want to know what's going on in the world than I used to. And how I many you know there's a pull for it? But I, what, what I want to show you is, it's not going to feed you. It's not going to strengthen you. And if you live your days looking at things and thinking about things that, are, that don't fit this list, you're probably not going to have peace. 
And so what we have to do is we have to be wise about what we put our attention on. Because here's the thing, only you choose what you focus on. It's your choice. I mean, even as I'm speaking this morning, you don't have to focus on what I'm saying. You can be thinking about fried chicken. <laughs> you can. Nobody can stop you. It's your choice. I mean, you know, just because you're looking at something and, and, and you look like you're listening, you don't, you're not necessarily. I mean, your attention's in your court. You could put your attention anywhere. You can be a million miles away from here right now. Amen. And I'm sure periodically all of us were, myself included, because it, it's difficult to stay completely focused on something for a long period of time. But what I'm saying is this. No one can make you focus on anything. That choice is yours. But when you focus on Jesus and you take these other things and you start to recognize their distractions, it will have an impact on your life. Because how many know, everybody here want peace? I want it, man. Well, there's decisions we have to make in order to arrive to that. And it's simply focusing on God and His love for us and focusing on Jesus. Amen? And so all of us, we have to, uh, we got to guard against distraction and not allow it to come into our lives and rob us of peace. Amen? Because we live in an age where there's more distraction than any other time, I think, ever on earth. Because with that little instrument in your, uh, in your pocket, you can connect to every single place in the world. It's an amazing thing. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, amen. We're, uh, we're good to go, man. You guys have an awesome day. Um, if you need prayer for...